It was a bad day for the professors were all forgetful. I forgot to leave a test for three fellows this morning. Now I forgot to bring my eyeglasses, my reading ones uh, from my office and how to go back. Uh, I'm afraid we're losing it, fellas. <laughs> and ladies. <laughs> So he has to make a speech, he said? That's <laughs> what he said. Thank you. And over 40, uh, over, uh, over 50 years of teaching, I don't remember a professor showing up for sure this before. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Dr. Bond, sometimes. Uh, with regularity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let us, <coughs> let us pray together. <coughs> we come before the, our Father in heaven with uh, confidence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We acknowledge before thee this day our unworthiness. We acknowledge also our uh, infirmity, our, our weakness, our, our lack of wisdom. We are dependent uh, altogether upon thee from day to day for that mercy which uh, we find at thy throne of grace. Grant it to us anew this day. Lift up our hearts uh, uh, unto thee. May we uh, put our trust altogether in thee, both for eternal salvation and for the, the daily provisions of life for our, ourselves and those uh, for whom we are responsible for their care. Uh, grant to us that we might manifest the mind of Christ at all times, uh, uh, self-sacrificing, showing uh, love uh, for thy people, and uh, so may we serve thee well. We thank thee for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for that spirit who... Uh, illumines our hearts to, to perceive the truth of that gospel and who draws uh, forth uh, confidence and trust in the uh, Savior. We pray that that spirit would uh, also uh, attend our study of thy word uh, from day to day and uh, brighten up for us the, the uh, prospects which are laid out before us in the word of prophecy. Uh, grant to us that we might understand thy will and thy way, how thy kingdom is coming to pass and that it shall be indeed a kingdom of great beauty and glory when we shall put away all tears and crying and pain and we shall delight in the fellowship of thy presence forevermore. This is our hope, this is our confidence, it is assured to us by the blood of the Lamb, his name we pray, amen. <coughs> now we're working on the 70 weeks passage in Daniel chapter 9 and uh, we had a lot of data that we uh, went through yesterday, and, and I think it would be useful just to try to walk through the, the general line of thought that we were trying to uh, pursue. <clears throat> and the whole thing then starts with the, the date of that chapter in, in Daniel 9, in the opening verse. And uh, <clears throat> it begins then, uh, in the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, me to, uh, of descent who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, and then he goes on to say, understood from the scriptures according to the word the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Now what's the logic of all of this? What's the significance of this first year of, uh, Sarai, of Darius uh, hyphen Cyrus? <coughs> Now we've seen that, working back from the end of the chapter, that the prophecy of Gabriel, 70 weeks prophecy or vision, is a response, an urgent response. <coughs> he comes rushing to Daniel in his uh, uh, prophecy. is an urgent response to Daniel's urgent prayer. Uh, and uh, from around verse 20 on, it's the uh, sort of... Uh, uh, link between the prophecy at the end and then the, the earlier part of the chapter and uh, it explains uh, the, how, how earnest uh, and uh, indeed urgent Daniel was in presenting his plea before the, the Lord. So there's an urgent uh, prophecy given in response to an urgent prayer. Now what made Daniel's prayer so ur urgent uh, at, at that particular point 
It, it was urgent because he understood the meaning of that first year of, of Darius Cyrus, and he understood the meaning of it because he had been studying the prophecies of Jeremiah, which then yesterday we looked at, chapter 25 in Jeremiah, which was dated 605, and which said that the exile of Israel was going to last uh, for 70 years, and that was the year 605. <coughs> Daniel 9, verse 1, our, our chapter is the year 539, 5 to 38, uh, but very significantly it's the year of, of Cyrus. It's the, the year that Babylon has already fallen because Cyrus is in place and Babylon is gone. And uh, that's the nature of that year. And uh, now, by his study of Jeremiah 25, and also then in chapter 29, uh, Daniel is aware that by divine prophecy through Jeremiah, uh, a prophecy which was a divine promise and commitment, the exile was going to last 70 years. Now whether you date the beginning of that exile right then in 605, which is also the, uh, the year that Daniel himself went into exile, the, the, the date in Daniel 1.1, or conceivably of whether you dated a little earlier with the death of Josiah and uh, I think there's evidence in the genealogies in Matthew 1 how uh, the, the, the Josiah was sort of thought of as, as really the end and everything from him on was captivity. So it's conceivable that you might think of that. You uh, have to work out 70 years somehow. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeremiah's prophecy was that the exile, which has begun certainly by then, if not a few years earlier, uh, was going to last 70 years. So it's just a question of whether that 70 years is something of a round number, which it would be from 605 to 539 to 538, or whether it would come out quite you know, exact if you date the beginning of it uh, back here in 609. But in any case, uh, 70 years of exile, Daniel understands, so it was uh, the, the length of the exile, and more especially, then it's the point uh, uh, that the, the end of the 70 years would be signalized by two events. And uh, the one was, the, in effect, the rise of Cyrus and, and the fall of, uh, of, of Babylon, putting it negatively. God was going to visit upon the Babylonians uh, for their sins at the end of the 70 uh, years. And then the other thing was the restoration of his own uh, people. Those were the two events that would mark that year. Daniel finds himself plunked in the middle. Here it is, it's the year 539, the first year of Cyrus. And then but he understands that because the first signal, the fall of Babylon, has taken place. He understands that the time is at hand for the fulfillment of God's promise concerning the 70 years, including the idea of the restoration. So point A, God has already fulfilled, and point B has not yet been fulfilled, and therefore the urgency of Daniel's prayer. He, he knows in the light of the prophecies that it is time for this to happen, the Babylon has fallen, but the decree for the restoration has not yet taken place. Now we know that before that year was over, that the decree was issued. Uh, Cyrus uh, issued the decree for the restoration uh, to, to take place. And it was uh, that decree of Cyrus then that uh, constituted the fulfillment of Jeremiah uh, 29, where he said that uh, that end of the 70 years would witness the uh, restoration from Babylon. So now then we, we went through uh, some of the other biblical evidence that did tie in Cyrus's decree in, in that year with the prophecy of, of Jeremiah. Might just remind us of, of uh, some of that <coughs> evidence. And, and while well, we looked at Second Chronicles 36, and toward the end of, of the, that, it described how, how Nebuchadnezzar first it described point A, the, the fall of Babylon, that marked the end of the seven years. But then it went on to describe how Cyrus then came on the scene and uh, issued a decree for the restoration. We did read this yesterday, so there's no need to go back. Uh, and uh, moreover, it explicitly states that this all happened in order to fulfill the prophecy of uh, Jeremiah, specifically chapter 29, 
that the exile would last 70 years and would result in a restoration. So Daniel's understanding of it agrees with the uh, understanding of the rest of the scripture here, that this year, according to divine prophecy and promise, marked the end of the 70 years exile and was to introduce the time of restoration. And uh, therefore, he pleased with God as one who, who is a promise keeper, a, a, a prophecy fulfiller, uh, that the, the time has come. Uh, and uh, if God fails now to, to uh, bring about the, the restoration, uh, God will have failed in his commitment that at the end of those 70 years, the restoration would take place. Now, in, in, in just checking out the mentality of the rest of the scripture, that this first year of Cyrus and this decree of Cyrus uh, is indeed what's in, in view here in the thought of, of the restoration of both the city and the temple we also just want to check out a couple of verses, those famous verses that you probably were dealing with in your paper on the servant of the Lord, and so far you checked out the, the discussion of how Cyrus might fit into that picture because he's described as an anointed one, as a Messiah. And you remember the passage was in Isaiah 44, toward the end of 44, and at the beginning of chapter 45. I'm sorry, call it the last verse in chapter 44 and the first and the, maybe the 13th verses in, in uh, chapter 45. We can just quickly look at that. <coughs> it will just serve to underscore further the, the, the significance of, of Cyrus and his decree in terms of the fulfilling of the 70 years and therefore the introduction of, of, the, of the, the 70 weeks. So in Isaiah 44, <coughs> The Lord's describing himself toward the end of that chapter as the one who, who is able by the, the word of his mouth to accomplish all sorts of mighty things like the drying up of the waters of the sea and so forth. And then moving on to the more contemporary situation in verse 28. How Omer, it says, describing the Lord, he is the one who says, La to, to Cyrus, Roi, my shepherd. So God is the one who identifies this pagan king as the one who will perform for him in relationship to his people Israel the role of a shepherd and the shepherd of course is a, a, a royal a image and uh, also my delight he, he will accomplish and then the Lord is also further described as, as saying uh, our, our Cyrus is now the, the, the one who, who says uh, who says to Jerusalem uh, she shall be built and who says concerning the temple let its foundations uh, be laid so in this verse, uh, Cyrus is identified as the one appointed of the Lord uh, as his under-shepherd, and as we'll see in a moment, uh, even uh, his Mishiko, his Messiah, his anointed one, uh, to bring about the, the restoration of the old typological order. And uh, verse, uh, the, the very next verse, it's a new chapter, but chapter 45, verse 1, thus says Yahweh, now you see, instead of just Roe, it's Mishiko, here's Cyrus. Uh, called the, the Lord's Messiah. And in terms of the, the typology of that ancient situation, he performed a, 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 a messianic role in terms of being the deliverer, the restorer of, uh, of the Lord's people. Uh, who says, namely to Cyrus, it goes on to say, it identifies this Mishik uh, right away as, as, as Cyrus, whom I have taken by his hand to lead him forth and so on. And, and I want to skip down now to verse 13 where it becomes quite explicit about to the role of Cyrus uh, as God's Messiah in, in the restoration of both city and, and temple. We've seen at the last verse in chapter 44 that he was involved both in, as the rebuilder of the city and also as the restorer of the temple. And um, in verse 13 of chapter 45, uh, I have raised up, the Lord says, one in righteousness, and all of his ways I will make straight. He shall build Eri, now there, who Yivne Eri, he will build my city. You see, it's not just the temple, and uh, my captives he will set free, not for price, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, so the picture clearly here in, this, in the, the Isianic prophecy uh, of, of Cyrus is that, that uh, he is the, the, the key figure, he is the Messiah figure. Uh, who restores not just the temple, uh, but the city. And I think we did say yesterday that, uh, that this needs a little emphasis that's over against uh, the dispensationalists who, who do not want to acknowledge uh, the significance of, of Cyrus in connection with uh, 
uh, the uh, 70 weeks prophecy concerning the restoration of the city and so forth, uh, and uh, who alleged then that, that, that Cyrus had to do only with the building of the temple and, and, and not the city. That simply is not the biblical mentality on, on, on uh, the subject. So uh, Daniel has it straight. Uh, the, the presence of Cyrus, the fall of Babylon, as according to Jeremiah 25, <coughs> signaled the end of the, the exile, of the time for the restoration, and it, uh, he therefore pleads now with the Lord uh, very urgently uh, uh, to accomplish this. And, and so our conclusion is going to be then uh, that uh, uh, the, the urgent prophecy is an immediate response uh, to an urgent prayer which was calling for uh, an immediate restoration of God's people and therefore that prophecy of the 70 weeks, the 70 weeks themselves had to begin right then and there in that first year of, of Cyrus. And it did. And so God kept his prompt. Before the year was over, uh, before the year was over, that second event had taken place. Cyrus has, had issued his decree, whoever there is among you, among his people, let the Lord bless him and let him go back and, and, and so on. And uh, so that's it. Now then when we are evaluating dispensationalism right away, uh, here is a, a basic flaw that, that, that does away with the whole dispensationalist approach to this. Much emphasis as they, they put upon this 70 weeks passage and reconstructing their, their distinctive eschatology uh, the, the way I usually put it, you know, if uh, if everything else in the, in the scripture seemed to be pointing in a dispensationalist uh, direction, this verse would disprove it. Instead of this being some key source of support for them, uh, the, this passage is really one that uh, completely destroys the dispensationalist position. Now, now mind you, uh, on their view of things, remember the 70 weeks don't begin and, until uh, 100 years later here, huh? Uh, Nehemiah 2, another decree of Artaxerxes, uh, they say starts. So, so here between 539 and 445, uh, what has happened? Daniel asked the Lord, uh, in order to keep your promise, it has to happen now. According to the dispensationalists, the Lord says uh, to Daniel, what is a hundred years between friends? Uh, so we're all... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, but that's what it amounts to. It, it just does not fit the, the demands of the, the context here in, uh, in, in Daniel 9. So that's the, the flow of thought we were engaged in yesterday trying to establish the, especially the, the point of origin, the beginning of the, the 70 weeks the start of the 70 weeks. Now, moreover, uh, we, we also then looked at that intermediate section, which brings Gabriel on, on the scene with the message uh, for Daniel, and we, we saw the, the sequence uh, in, involving the, the language of Yatsa Dabar, where, where Gabriel, as, as he comes with, with his urgent reply to Daniel's urgent prayer, uh, he, he says, certainly, the, you, you are right. The Lord must uh, uh, fulfill the promise pronto or he will uh, be a, a promise breaker. And uh, as a matter of fact, the decree's already gone forth, he says, when you began to pray. As soon as you began to pray along this uh, line, the Lord already was answering your prayer. Now, ultimately, it was the decree of Cyrus that would get things moving on planet Earth, uh, but uh, behind the scenes in the upper register, the, the all-decisive decree has already gone forth, which will simply come to expression then before the year is out in what Cyrus does. But the, the already, Yatsa Davar, the decree has already gone forth. And a moment later, he says, so now understand the, this, this decree. And uh, this decree is uh, then made parallel to the Mare, which is the vision. And the vision, of course, is the 70 weeks uh, uh, prophecy. So the decree has gone forth. Understand this de 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 decree, this, this uh, vision of the 70 weeks. And uh, agreeably, in verse 25, when uh, we're dealing with the actual prophecy of the, the 70 weeks, it uh, then picks up this language of the decree has gone forth, all, which it has already done. And it, it then has the Mozart Davar from Yatsa. It has the noun Mozart Davar. And it says, from the going forth of the decree unto the Messiah, there are seven weeks, 60 and, and two. So uh, this, this the Yatsa Davar language uh, 
in uh, the uh, introductory words of, of Gabriel uh, that demonstrate that then, uh, again, uh, underscore the point that of the immediacy, the immediacy of God's response uh, to this prayer, the fulfilling of it, and uh, therefore the necessity of seeing the starting point of the 70 weeks itself as uh, right then and there in, in uh, that particular year, the first year of Cyrus. Now, <clears throat> That means, of course, if the, if the first year of the 490 years of the 70 weeks, and the, the word weeks there could refer to weeks of days, years, and so on, but by general uh, agreement, uh, there's really n no debating that. Uh, it, it's year, uh, weeks of years that we're dealing with, and so 70 weeks equals 490 years, all right, and that's not under dispute. But what is the question is whether they are literal years or not, and that answer is settled at once then by the starting point. The starting point is all decisive, and it, 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 it rules out at once the literal view and, and it demands a symbolic view. 490 years would not take you from uh, uh, 539, the starting point, up to Christ, let alone uh, then to 70 AD. And mind you, 70 AD is in there, uh, there too. There's no doubt about it. Jesus, for example, himself interprets uh, uh, Daniel uh, 9 there, the verse... 27 about the abomination of desolations with reference to the events of 70 AD and so 70 AD falls within the 70 weeks as well and uh, the uh, literalist uh, view of the dispensationalists uh, 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 well uh, the, the, the starting point of 539 forbids then uh, that uh, you can have just a literal 490 years because that would not get you up to Christ, it would not get you up to 78 days, so the, the, that, that's why, as we said, the, the dispensationalists must resort to that later date of 445 in order to get things up to Christ. Mind you, even even at that, see, they, they, they date the starting point at 445 in order to get you up to Christ, but they still haven't included 70 AD. And there's just no question about 70 AD is, is part of what happens within these 70 uh, weeks. and. Uh, and they, for all their literalism, they still don't succeed in, in, in including uh, uh, getting the year 70 AD in, into the, the picture. And in fact, as we'll be seeing, one of the major flaws then with the dispensationalist scheme is that you know they take it up to the triumphal entry. Well, the triumphal entry isn't even up to the cross, huh? So the cross <coughs> falls beyond. It's uh, with a 7 plus 62, huh? So the cross falls beyond the 69th week, and of course the 70th week doesn't come until, according to them, until the parousia event later on. And uh, so the, the cross, and also the 70 AD event. Look, these are the two big things that the passage tells us are, are going to happen within the 70 weeks. These are the climactic events, what the Lord does on the cross by way of establishing the new covenant, what he does in 70 AD by way of terminating the Old Covenant. Uh, these are the, the, the two big things that are going to transpire within the 70 weeks. Neither of them happens within the 70 weeks on the dispensationalist scheme. On a dispensationalist scheme, the two major events that belong to the 70 weeks fall in a crack between the end of the 69th and the beginning of the 70th week. So that, that is, you see, an, a, another major uh, uh, flaw in the, the dispensationalist uh, uh, scheme. Well, now we want to get at this more positively, and not just in terms of the polemics against dispensationalism, as we were saying, but also in terms of, of the, the, the rich positive disclosure of Christ, the, 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 the king Christ, the, the priest. And uh, so we returned the, then to the text, but then noting that the alternative to the alternative to the <coughs> literalist view is, is, uh, is a symbolic one, and, and uh, the symbolism is, you know, manifestly clear. Uh, Seventy weeks, it's uh, uh, with the, the, a division into one block of seven, in fact, uh, uh, which is a jubilee period, which is 49 years, seven weeks, 49 years, so that is a jubilee period. The whole thing, 70, the idea of weeks tells you it's sabbatical symbolism. Then more precisely, uh, 409, uh, or rather 70 weeks, 490 years, uh, that, that's 10 jubilee periods. Uh, seven weeks is one jubilee period. Uh, there, there's just no question about it. That's the message, the, 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 this chronological uh, framework, to use that language again, uh, 
uh, it, it, it conveys the message. It's, it's a message about jubilee events, the, in the jubilee, the year of redemption for God's people, the day of vengeance against the enemies of God's uh, people. That, that's what the, the, uh, is uh, signified by, by Sabbath and, and by jubilee, and that's what this is all about. This is all about the, the ultimate consummating of God's redemptive purposes, but also unhappily it involves the, the, the ultimate judging of the Old Covenant uh, order. Now this, uh, this symbolic view of the thing wow. is not just some recent in, interpretation of, of those of us who are trying to oppose dispensationalism or, or something. It's actually a, a very a ancient view. And um, in that article that I mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, which I called the covenant of the 70th week, uh, if I can find the right place here, I'll read a bit from it. Um, Well, expounding the 70 years of exile in terms of the explanation of the exile given in Leviticus 26.43, remember we looked at that passage yesterday, the chronicler depicts it as a time of sabbatical rest for the land to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score years and ten. Here, each of the 70 years is seen as functioning as a sabbatical year so that the 70 years are the equivalent of 70 weeks of years. Under the exile's condition of continuing desolation, 490 years were telescoped into 70 because the uh, desolate land leaped without the normal six-year intervals of labor from one seventh year of rest immediately to its next sabbatical year. Thus, Gabriel's 70 weeks prophecy actually made use of the very same symbol as the 70 years prophecy of Jeremiah. And that symbol is explained in Second Chronicles 36, uh, 21, which we read yesterday as, as a sabbatical. Now, early adoption, early adoption of a sabbatical interpretation of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel 9 is attested in the manuscript from uh, Qumran, <coughs> from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the 11th cave, therefore called 11Q, 11 Qumran, Melchizedek, is uh, the text that deals with Melchizedek, and his, that gave the, the name to it, 11Q uh, Melchizedek. And uh, I, I'd referred to that particular document earlier, and so I say here, which, as noted above, equates the tenth and last jubilees. That's a passage that, that dealt with this pattern of, of jubilees and, and had the same pattern of ten jubilees and, and spoke of the tenth one as the last one. This composition is a midrashic development of the Leviticus 25 year, uh, year of jubilee. Uh, just before that Leviticus 26 passage, which was so important, talking about the exile and the significance of the Todah prayer and, and so on. In the preceding chapter, Leviticus 25 deals with the whole subject of the ju Jubilee. And uh, this 11Q Melchizedek then is, is expounding upon uh, the, that thought of, of the Jubilees in, in Leviticus 25. And as it does so, into this development, it works the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. So it, 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 it utilizes Daniel 9 uh, as, uh, as implementing or il illustrating what it's talking about in its uh, discussion of the Jubilee passage in uh, Leviticus 25. Into this development it works the 70 weeks passage of, uh, of Daniel 9 and so provides an interpretation of that prophecy at the same time. In this interpretive text coming perhaps from about the time of our Lord uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 are seen as a series of 10 jubilees, culminating in a proclamation of deliverance, atonement, vengeance on Zion's enemies, and the establishing of God's covenant among his uh, people. So uh, that's an ancient uh, interpretation. The, the, the symbolic view is, uh, is not some uh, recent uh, uh, 21st century development. So. Uh, Symbolic, not uh, literal, is the, the nature of, uh, of uh, these uh, uh, days. Now then we can turn to uh, the text, just, just summing up the point we're making then. 70 weeks, years, 10 jubilee periods, 7 62 and 1, 7, one jubilee period in order to accomplish the immediate answer to Daniel's prayer. The immediate answer to Daniel's prayer, which had uh, concern with the typological city and, and, and temple and, and, and mountain of the Lord. 
10 jubilee periods set aside to fulfill God's ultimate purposes in history uh, for the bringing in of the eternal jubilee, the eternal city, the eternal temple. Uh, so the, the, that is the, the comprehensive uh, message of, of the, the very form of the of the, the 70 weeks. Now the passage then begins, so they're looking uh, now at, uh, at uh, Daniel 9. In verse 24, it uh, begins with uh, a six-fold statement of the purposes. <laughs> well, we just summarized it in broad terms. <clears throat> but now more specifically, the, the purpose of the uh, 70 weeks is described in terms of, of six accomplishments that are in view. That's looking at verse 24. It begins then, Shavuim. Weeks, Shavim, 70. 70 weeks, Nechta, Nifal form here, are cut off, are, are set aside, are, are decreed, appointed, concerning your city, or your, excuse me, Amakai, your people, and also concerning the city of your temple, all right, your temple city. The Daniel, that corresponds uh, to Daniel's concern as expressed up in verse 20 where it says that he was making his supplications concerning Har Kodesh Elohai, concerning, there he called it the mountain, the mountain of the temple of my God. Here in the, the purpose statement, it uh, is uh, something that concerns your people <coughs> and, and, and the city of, of your temple, Zion in, 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 in short. Zion, the city of God, the mountain of God, both typological and antitypical. Specifically, first of all, the Kale Hapesha. Within within these uh, uh, seventy weeks, something would be done uh, with uh, with transgression, and uh, there are going to be, as I said, the the, the six statements. I <clears throat> tend to d divide them into three pairs. Uh, an another way of dividing them might be into two triads. For example, E.J. Young divides them into two groups of three each. And uh, he does so on the basis that he says the first three uh, each has a, a something negative in it, a word for sin. Uh, and uh, so he puts those by itself. I think it works out uh, more meaningful if you, uh, if you uh, have uh, three pairs. The first uh, two then uh, comprise Lekale Hapesha. And another couple of uh, little textual things we uh, should pay a little attention to here. Um, Kale would mean to restrain. The, with the Aleph, with the Aleph uh, on the end. And uh, a, an alternative suggestion, however, is that the Aleph be changed to a He, and then you get the more general term, to bring to an end, to complete, to bring to an end. So the, the thought then is either more specifically to restrain transgression or to uh, bring it to an end. A rather similar uh, choice uh, confronts us with the next uh, two words, which I, I would take as a pair now here. If you look at your text, it's a U. It's, it's one of those Katib Kare situations. You remember in your Hebrew now, Katib Kare? Uh, it's where there's a textual problem. And the uh, Katib, that which is written, is the consonantal text. And so the scribes saw a particular set of consonants there, but they didn't think that's what should be read. And so they uh, suggest a, a, a different reading uh, by the vocalization, the kare, that which was to be read, you see. Now, in, in, th in this case, the, uh, the consonants that uh, were found in the text, you see, they didn't change the, the consonants themselves. They suggested another reading by substituting uh, vowels uh, for other uh, consonants. The, the verb itself would be the, the, a verb that begins with a hait, hatam which is, in fact, the very same word that is used if you look ahead to the fifth of the six purposes, uh, where it says, Wilak tom hazon with navi, to seal up vision and prophecy. That verb, hatam, with a hate, means to seal up. And now the, uh, the scribes here tell us that instead of reading those consonants, and to read it, therefore, and to seal up sin, uh, we should uh, uh, substitute uh, a different reading. Instead of a hate, we should read, they suggest, a, a hey. 
And then the form, if you look at your footnote, you perhaps uh, see what it would, would be. Uh, it, it would be from the verb tamam, with the double uh, ayin. Uh, it would be uh, the, the tau, main, main, tamam, which also is, is a, a general word like the kala with a hate, meaning to complete. And it would be a, a hifiel infinitive a construct then from uh, tamam. So the katib would uh, be uh, pointed the same as it is a little later, laktom, laktom. And it would mean to, to seal up uh, sin. The kare, the, the reading suggested by the, the vowels uh, of the text associated with the consonants given in your footnote, uh, would uh, mean a, and to bring an end. So that there are these fussy little textual things which really don't alter the, 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 the point at all. It, it just be in the one case you have a little more concrete. It would be saying to to restrain and, and to seal a, a up a sin, uh, like uh, oh, putting someone, in, uh, Daniel, in, in, into the pit and covering it over and, and sealing it up and restraining and that kind of a, a, a specific a concrete picture is over against the general thought of, of bringing to an end. Uh, either way, uh, as I see it, it, it's the message of the fall of Israel. Hmm. Uh, th through all of the, the generations, Israel has been offending against the, the Lord. The, the lawsuit's been going ahead, and uh, there has been already the, the exile that has taken uh, place from which they are go going to be restored. Uh, but before it's all over, 70 AD is in view down the road there, too. And uh, by that point, God will have fully dealt uh, then and, and put an end uh, in, in final judgment uh, on, on the old order. Uh, to that old order. So there's the first pair, and then uh, the second pair, uh, and it turns out to be just a magnificent description of, of the work of, of Christ, and it's the two together that give us the negative and the positive, and which uh, leads me to favor treating them as a pair rather than taking the third one along with the first two as a triad. Uh, well, the third one then, as you look at your text, uh, is uh, has the thought of atonement in it. Uh, uh, le caper awon. Uh, yes, it, it does have another word for sin, but as I say, I don't think that's as significant as the uh, as, as, the, as the, the the nice pair that you get if you combine this to make an atonement for uh, iniquity with the next one, which is positively le uh, havi zedek olamim to bring in everlasting righteousness. Uh, so there's a, that passive o obedience of, of Christ that, uh, that does away with uh, sin by making atonement and achieving forgiveness. There's the active obedience of Christ, the righteousness, uh, which is uh, brought in and attributed to his people, which is an everlasting righteousness. So uh, the first two I see as, uh, as describing the, the end of the old order, that covenant of works or arrangement, the fall of Israel. The second pair is dealing with the, the, the new covenant Messiah will in, in, introduce and, uh, and uh, fulfill, uh, which will lead to the fullness uh, of uh, God's promises. And then the last, uh, the last pair is a sort of a, 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 an underscoring of the finality of, of what's going on here. This is the last period in history. These 70 weeks consume all of uh, the rest of history and, and bring us to the, the consummation. There's nothing beyond this. So all prophecy will have been fulfilled by the end of these uh, 70 weeks. That, that's the, the basic message that comes across in the, uh, this last pair, the fifth and the sixth uh, items. Conceivably, the fifth one might be associated more with the first pair, the fall of Jerusalem, and uh, the sixth one associated more with the second uh, pair and and the consummation of the new order, but the, the, the language then, uh, let's see, is, uh, well, the fifth one, we, we checked out when we were talking about the verb hatam to seal, and here it is, and there's no textual problem here, the, the, it, it says now, and to seal up, the fifth purpose is to seal up. Hazon and Navi, literally, vision and prophet, vision and prophet, but the, the meaning is clear. Well, whatever the, 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 the prophets uh, have been declaring, whatever they have seen in, de in their vision and, and, and report it, and then, uh, as I said, perhaps with special reference to the, the whole series of Old Testament prophets and, and the, the Old Testament uh, uh, order, although there'd be no great difficulty if we wanted to e expand the thought uh, to, to prophets of the Old and New Testament and, uh, and regard this as uh, referring to the, the, the 
the sealing up of, of both the old order and, and, and the new order. And then the final one, I think, is, uh, is uh, you know, very rich in, in its, uh, in its uh, uh, symbolism, uh, and it uh, really describes the, the ultimate purpose of all of creation. In fact, I think what we have here, you see, is, is a sort of a, a creation motif in, in the fact, the presence of the six works, the six purposes of the 70 weeks. The, the overall framework that we're talking about is a sabbatical framework. And then within that, uh, we have the, the, the six elements of, of uh, the works that are going to lead to that ultimate Sabbath, that ultimate uh, uh, jubilee. And uh, the, the ultimate purpose of creation, right, right from uh, the, the, the original creation and once again in the redemptive uh, recreation, the ultimate purpose of it all is, of course, to produce uh, the, the, the cosmic uh, people uh, temple in the spirit. Huh? That's what God has been doing from the beginning, to, uh, to establish his, his glory uh, temple on, on a universal cosmic scale and to incorporate his, his, his people into it as the, the anointed temple pe people possessed by the glory spirit. That that's the, what it has been about uh, since the beginning of creation and that ultimate purpose will be achieved by the time you come to the end of the 10th jubilee and, and, uh, and uh, the eternal uh, jubilee is ushered in. <coughs> the actual language of the sixth uh, purpose is uh, then brings in now the language of anointing. Huh? So, uh, it, and to anoint the holy of holies, uh, to anoint the holy of, of holies, to pour out the, the spirit of, upon the, the temple. That that's the the climax of of the the central narratives in the, in uh, the Old Testament. The central narratives in the Old Testament are those of the building of God's house. Uh, with his presence in, in the, the midst of his people. And uh, Moses does it, and uh, Exodus 40 is the account uh, of the anointing uh, of the Holy of Holies as, as he anoints uh, the tabernacle uh, with uh, oil, and then the glory spirit itself comes and, and anoints uh, the tabernacle and, and fills it with the, the glory of God. There's the end of history uh, set forth for us, and once again, the same sort of thing happens uh, with uh, with Solomon and the, the building of, of that temple. These two great typological anticipations of of uh, the the end of uh, all history are set forth there. And to anoint it, uh, the anointing is, uh, could be either the, the individual, huh? Uh, or the, the, the corporate uh, 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 temple, and it's both, you know. Ju in just a moment, we're gonna read about the anointed one. So it's hard to read about this sixth purpose to anoint the Holy of Holies and not to connect it with the anointed one who is mentioned in the next verse. And uh, so we can see that uh, this prophecy of, of the, the building of the, the ultimate temple of God in the spirit uh, certainly involves uh, right at the heart of it at stage one the, the, the anointing of, of Jesus himself who is that temple okay so he he, <coughs> he is the temple he is the holy of holies and of course <coughs> he incorporates his people together uh, with himself in, into that structure <coughs> excuse me so I think we, we are justified in seeing all of that, uh, both the individual messianic fulfillment uh, of it and then the, the broader uh, concept of the, the church, the, the redeemed of all the ages as, as the, the eternal living temple, the body uh, of Christ. So it's, uh, you know, this, the, the purposes of the 70 weeks then are just uh, ultimate, they are grand, the, the, this is what it's all, all about. and. Uh, it certainly would take the, the totality of history short, short of the consummation. Uh, you know, this isn't fulfilled. That recreation, that ultimate new heavens and earth is uh, not in place. That ultimate holy of holies is, is not in place and, until the very end of history and the 70 weeks can't be terminated, therefore, uh, short of that. All right, so that's the, 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 the scope of the... And, and the six purposes, the six works that lead up to the Sabbath rest. It's, so it's creational, it's creational uh, imagery then that we also have in this uh, passage. Now moving on to the 25th verse. 
we have the grand purpose of the 70 weeks as a whole, and uh, now it's going to be broken down because this will involve two stages of history, the, the old covenant and, and, and the new, with the two very different outcomes uh, for each of those uh, stages. And, uh, you know, we, it has to begin where, where Daniel was. It, uh, there, there's an answer to Daniel's prayer. He was concerned for the typological stage of things, for the Jerusalem that was lying desolate there, uh, still in that first year of, of, of Cyrus before the decree. He, he was concerned about that city and, 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 uh, and that mountain and, and that temple. And uh, that will be the first order of the day. Uh, within the 70 weeks, and uh, so seven weeks now are set aside. 539, 538 BC, as you say. So seven weeks are set aside. Well, the way it's expressed first at all is a uh, from. Uh, let's look at the text. <clears throat> Gabriel ur ur urges uh, Daniel once again to understand, so no one understand. Then we, <coughs> we come to that min moza davar that we were referring to, uh, from the going forth of the decree. And uh, the, what the decree is, we've seen, has already been explained in the preceding verses when, when Gabriel said the decree has already gone forth. Uh, it's gone forth from God and uh, that that has started these uh, 70 uh, weeks. So from the going forth of the decree, which has already gone forth, and the decree is to the effect uh, the, uh, to restore and to build. So you have these two infinitive constructs from uh, the verb shuv and banal and putting them together, you can just translate it the, the decree to restore, hmm? the, the decree to build again, to the, the decree to rebuild. So from the going forth of the, of, uh, the decree uh, of, of God, which will also take expression in the decree of Cyrus, the decree to uh, rebuild Jerusalem. Ad Mashiach, all right? We just read about the anointing of the Holy of Holies, and now we read about an anointed one. And uh, he has a double title, and this becomes important to, to recognize the, 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 the character of, of, of this designation, uh, the Mashiach Nagid, the, the combination of the two. It's the, the two terms used here at the beginning together to designate the, the Christ. And then as the passage uh, is unpacked, uh, as you move along, these two titles are used individually. But there shouldn't be any mistake that if you read about a Mashiach again, it's this Mashiach. And if you read about a Nagid again, it's, it's this Nagid. He is Mashiach and Nagi. Now that's a, a, another, I think, obvious feature that, that uh, again, dispensationalists and others did just ignore, and uh, they, they don't. Have, the Nagi for them is is uh, not at all identified with the Messiah and so on. But the, the text right away at the beginning uh, unites them for us. And so the text says then that there will be weeks seven plus sixty-two. All right. 7 plus uh, 62, which equals 1 through 7, and then 8 through 69, unto Messiah Nagid, all right, unto Messiah. So in other words, from the starting point in 539 up to Christ, uh, there were 69 uh, weeks, which is, what, 483 years or whatever. And... Um, That leaves, of course, the one more week, which will follow Christ. And the following verse will help us to draw the line between them more precisely. And when it does, it actually draws the line at the cross, so that the cross, the cutting off of Christ, uh, becomes the dividing line between the mark in the end of the 69 weeks and, and the introduction of the 70th week, the covenant of, of uh, the 70th week. So verse 25a sets up these major divisions for us. Then verse 25b goes back and picks up on this first block, the, the first seven weeks, introduced by the decree to restore the city, and it tells us uh, how the, that will be uh, carried out. And then when you uh, move, move on beyond verse 25, verse 26 and 20, verse 27, will then pick up the thought of the Messiah. 
So there has been the, the, the thought of seven weeks, 62 to Messiah. The 70 weeks then are expounded further in verse 25b, and then the Messiah is expounded further in verses 26 and 27. Well, within the seven weeks then, what does it say would happen? Uh, uh, 25b, uh, it, it simply goes on and to say, uh, and, and it will, it repeats the same two verbs that we had up above, the shuv and the bana. Uh, the, the, from the going forth of the decree to, to build will be seven weeks. And now picking up on that, it repeats those two uh, same verbs and says it will be built uh, again. And the, the, the construction is described in terms of rachov and harutz. Rachov uh, refers to the broad place, the street. Hmm? Uh, perhaps leading it up to the gate. Harutz is problematic. Uh, harutz, uh, well, actually in, in, in uh, form, it uh, looks like a cow passive participle of, of a verb which is uh, actually used in verse 26 to refer <coughs> to the thought of that which has been determined, to that which has been decreed. But that doesn't seem to fit here. And, uh, and uh, an alternative mean, meaning that it has to do perhaps with uh, some feature of the construction of the city, perhaps the moat outside uh, the city walls. Uh, and, and if that is uh, accurate, then perhaps uh, the thought is of both inside and outside, the, the street, the inside, the major feature of the inside, and then the moat on the outside. And the thought would be there will be a total uh, restoration of, of the city, uh, inside street, outside moat. And... Uh, and so, yes, Daniel, your prayer will be answered. Uh, the, the Cyrus will issue the decree, things will un unfold, and, and the city and, uh, will, will be uh, restored. Your, your prayer will be answered. Uh, it will start to happen, indeed, uh, at, at once. Nevertheless, and, and then there is this uh, sort of modification of, of the brightness of, of the hope that, that it wouldn't all be easy going. Cyrus would issue the decree, they would make certain progress, but the, especially as you know from the accounts in Ezra and so on, uh, that they would encounter, the ones who returned, would encounter all kinds of opposition from uh, those who uh, were, were already in the land and who weren't looking for the Jews to come, come back, to welcome them there at all. And uh, so there would be many a problem that would call for uh, subsequent uh, Persian leaders to issue new edicts uh, like that one the dispensationalists uh, refer to in 445, but it's, uh, that wasn't the only one. There's a whole series of them. Uh, it, it would take a whole series of, uh, of, of decrees and interventions by the Persian kings to keep the ball rolling and, and uh, in connection with the return of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, to uh, restore the, the city. And so the text says uh, it will be re restored inside and outside, but in distress of the times, in, in, in the difficulty of of uh, the, the, the times, and that corresponds very much uh, to the history. Ezra 4, Ezra 4 we would run through that history of, 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 the, of the reconstruction and, and, and uh, the, the troubles that attended it, and, uh, and then Ezra 5 would uh, pick up the next theme of going back. It's, a, it's one of those cases of dyschronology as narrative or thematic treatment where you, you go through one theme up to a certain point and then you backtrack and go through that same history of Persian kings again from the opposite point of view, namely in spite of all of those uh, troubles, uh, so the, 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 they finally accomplished what they were up to. Now that was going to be therefore the purpose of this first jubilee period. One week set aside to answer your prayer, Daniel, and it will happen, whatever difficulties, it will, it will be accomplished. And so for a date for the, the end of that, if we were to, we, we just suggest that as, as a round number approximation by the time you come to the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, by the time, let's say, you come to the, the end roughly of the Old Testament canon, around 400 B.C. We might mark the end of, of uh, this uh, or as an alternative, perhaps the, the thinking is that uh, and th throughout the Persian period, at least, uh, the, there would be restoration and, and until you come to uh, the time of the Greeks. And that would take you then farther down into the fourth uh, century and, and, uh, uh, to come down to Alexander and so on. But uh, someplace there along the line, the, the symbolic jubilee would be fulfilled and the temple and the city would be back there as Daniel. Uh, prayed. Let's uh, pray.
break there for five minutes.